Across Five Acres by Irene Hunt. Day one, chapter one. Ellen Creighton and her nine-year-old son, Jethro, were planting potatoes in the half acre just south of their cabin that morning in mid-April, 1861. They were out in the field as soon as breakfast was over. In Southern Illinois, at that hour, it was pink with sunrise and swelling red bud and clusters of bloom over the apple orchard across the road. Jethro walked on the warm clods of plowed earth and felt them crumble beneath his feet as he helped his mother carry the tub of potato cuttings they had prepared the night before. It's damp fur down and warm on top, he remarked, poking a brown hand deep into the soil. Once we get these planted and a soft rain comes, we'll have a crop to make people up north call us Egypt for sure. He filled the burlap pouch with the potato cuttings and hoisted it expertly to his thin shoulder where a batch of new freckles was beginning, just beginning to appear. The world seemed a good place to him that morning, and he felt ready to stride down the length of the field with a firm step and a joke on his lips. You reckon we'll be through by the time ham and cornbread is ready for, di for dinner, Miss Creighton, he asked, grinning. He called her Miss Creighton sometimes, as his older brothers did when they teased her. It was just a step from the too bold joke of addressing her by her given name. His mother smiled back at him, acknowledging his mood, but she shook her head at his words. Your hopes is making a fool of your reason, Jeff. We're lucky if these taters is bedded by noon tomorrow. She made short, quick cuts with her hoe in the mellow soil and waited, waited until Jethro placed the cutting, cutting eye upward in the spot hollowed out for it, after <clears throat> which she raked a covering of soil over it and moved down the long furrow. She was a small, spare woman with large, dark eyes and skin as brown and dry as leather. She had been a pretty girl back in the 1830s when she married Matthew Creighton, but prettiness was short-lived among country women of her time. She didn't think much about it anymore except now and then when Jenny's 14-year-old radiance was especially compelling. Even if she had been con concerned, <clears throat> there were reverberations of Calvinism strong within her which would have protested vigorously against the vanity of regret for passing beauty. She had borne 12 children, four of whom were dead, perhaps five, for the oldest son had not been heard from since he left for the gold fields of California 12 years before. She had lived through sickness, poverty, and danger for over 30 years. The sight of a pretty face might bring a tired smile to her lips, but it was a thing of little value in Ellen's world. Jethro was her youngest child, born in the year of 52, a year in which three of her children died within one week of the dreaded disease they called the child's paralysis, a disease which struck the country that year, people said, like the soldiers of Herod. Ellen knew that she favored her youngest son, that she overlooked shortcomings in Jethro for which her older children had been punished. It was a weakness of her advancing years, she supposed, but this was the son who had been spared that summer when children all around were dying of the agonizing sickness. It looked as if somehow destiny had marked him. One didn't talk about such things. The world, she knew, was impatient with women who valued their own children too highly. Ellen kept her silence, but she saw signs of special talents in Jethro, and she watched over him with special tenderness. They worked together for an hour or more without speaking. Ellen was grave and absorbed in the anxious thoughts of that spring. Jeth Jethro was accustomed to adapting himself to the behaviors and mood moods of older people, and he found enough in the world about him to occupy his interest as he worked. A south breeze brought the scent of lilacs and sweet fennel to his nostrils and set all the frosty green leaves of a silver poplar tree to trembling. There was a column of wood smoke feathering up from the kitchen chimney, a sign that Jenny was already making preparations for a hearty noon meal. From the neighboring field across the creek, he could hear the shouted commands to the plowed horses as Matt Creighton and his two older sons got on with the spring plowing. It was a fine morning. Many people around him were troubled, he knew, but that was part of the adult world, which he accepted as a matter of course. Adults were usually troubled. There were, <clears throat> there were chinch bugs and grasshoppers, ma month, months of drought, elections, slavery, secession, talk of war. The adult world of trouble, though, was not real enough to dim the goodness of an April morning. At about seven o'clock, a team and wagon pulled out of the barn lot, stopping for a minute before turning into the road while the driver spoke to a girl who came running out to the kitchen door. Jethro chuckled. Shad's leaving for Newton now, I guess. Jenny has to say goodbye like as if he's going to the North Pole. He 
washed the wagon from the center of his eye as he worked, and when the team started coming down the road toward the potato patch, he put the heavy bag of cuttings aside and raced across the field to the roadside. His mother laid down her hoe and followed slowly, picking her way over the mounds of plowed earth that Jethro's feet seemed barely to touch. The young schoolmaster stopped the team and climbed down from the wagon to stand at the fence row, waiting for Jethro and Ellen to come up from, the, from midfield. <coughs> He was a tall, powerfully built youth of twenty, with a firm mouth and grave, dark eyes that gave him the appearance of an older man. He had come out from Pennsylvania three years earlier to study at <coughs> McKendree College, where an uncle was a professor of natural philosophy, a subject that later generations would call physics. Faced with insufficient funds to carry on his studies at the end of his first year, Young Yale had turned to the country schools as a stepping stone toward further work in college, and a series of circumstances had led him to the school for which Mac Rayton served as director. Here he had stayed, not just one year, as originally planned, but two, and now in 1861 he had hired himself out as a farmhand to Matt for the summer and contracted to teach still a third term that fall. He'd been stricken with typhoid fever during his first year of teaching, and Ellen Creighton had patiently nursed him back to health with the skills she had learned over the years. There was a strong tie of affection between the two of them. Ellen counted Shadrach as part of the, her family and looked after him as she did her own. Shadrach Yale, in turn, showed a thoughtful courtesy for her. A few women of the praises, prairies received from their own sons. Will you be back by supper time, Shad? Jethro called breathlessly as he approached the fence row. At school, he addressed the young teacher as master, but now the Shadrach was so much a member of the family, the necessary formalities of a schoolroom were forgotten. It's not likely, Jeff. Not before night or maybe later. He was mature enough at 20 to appreciate being a hero to a nine-year-old boy. Besides that, Jethro's quick mind and delight in learning had been a source of pleasure for studious young Yale who had known the frustration of trying to penetrate the apathy and unconcern of Backwood's classroom. He had talked to both parents about the promise he recognized in the boy. Matt, in spite of his pleasure, had shaken his head and wondered if the praise for Jethro had not stemmed from interest in Jethro's sister, Jenny. But Ellen had no doubts the praise was in line with what she herself believed, firmly. She stood beside the gray rails that morning with her arms hands folded beneath her apron. Matt had made a pretext of needing supplies from town, but she knew that this trip to Newton in the midst of a late planting season would be would have been unthinkable except for the urgency of getting word from the world beyond their own fields and woods, pa woods pastures. Her face looked drawn in the bright sunlight. I wish there was a telegraph in Newton, Chad, she said. You know, if there's one and only, they'll send any important news on up to Newton as soon as they come through. At any rate, I'll bring the latest papers. Seems sometimes there's a deep silence all about us out here waiting to be filled. She and the young man looked at one another, each pair of eyes dark with anxiety. Jethro kicked a stone in the road. Sure wished I was going to town with you, Chad, he said finally, because it seemed that somebody must say something. I don't know. Well, there'll be other trips this summer, Jeff. Shadrach started to climb back into the wagon as he spoke. Then, changing his mind, he turned back and paced, placed his hands quickly on Ellen's shoulders. Try not to worry, he said quietly. The caress brought a sudden tears to, to her eyes. She and Jethro stood watching as he drove away when the wagon disappeared in a clump of trees at a bend in the road. Ellen turned back to her work as slowly as if overwhelmed by deep weariness. Lord knows what news he'll bring back. She said, there may be more of the land at this minute for all we know. Jethro was depressed by her somber mood, but not by the imminence of war. He had listened to his brother Tom and their cousin Ab, the two younger of the grown boys in the household, and their excitement had found its way into his blood. Dread of war was a womanly weakness. He had discovered evidence by his mother's melancholy and the tears of Jenny and his brother's John's wife, Nancy. I heard some of the big fellers talking the other night, and they said the war, even if it comes, will be no more than a breakfast bell. They said that soldiers, soldiers up here can take the south by the britches and make it holler. Enough quicker 
no quicker than it takes coffee to cool off for swallowing. Jeth <coughs> Jethro spoke hurriedly, almost sure that the words would anger his mother and vaguely realizing that he wanted to anger her a little for spoiling the brightness of the morning by her obvious sadness. She had a way of closing her eyes briefly when exasperated as if to reject for at least a second the existence of a folly that she was bound to recognize later. Her hoe jabbed deeper and more sharply into the brown earth at her feet. The foolish youngins and they're talking without a spark of reason to guide their words, she said angrily. It ain't that I don't love them, but talk or not, she added. But I'm fearful of the day when they face their companies. I fear, I'm fearful of the time when I'll have no boys left but you and three little ones up on Walnut Hill. Jethro squirmed inwardly. There was go were going to be tears and talk of children who had died the summer he was born. He wanted to escape. And since Juan didn't easily escape from his mother in the midst of planting a half acre of potatoes, he searched hurriedly for a way to turn the conversation. Did ever I tell you, Ma, of an old fellow that give all the people of the earth their come up, come up in it? He asked brightly, knowing that she was always proud to hear of the things he had learned from Shadrach at school. I reckon you didn't, Jeff. Jeff, not that I'm able to recollect. Jethro straightened his shoulders a little under the weight upon them. Well, ma'am, there was a long time when people allowed that the earth was a, was the big kingpin amongst all the stars and things. They, they thought that the moon and the sun and all the stars went out round the earth and maybe <clears throat> tipped their hats as they went by. Shad says that most everybody went on believing that for years till... Finally, there come along this man I'm telling you about. He was head and shoulders smarter than the run of the mill, and after he'd watched the sun and moon and stars for a long time, he sat down and he'd done some figuring. Well, he got through figuring, he showed it to some other fellers, and there it was, plain as anything. The earth wasn't the big kingpin after all. He allowed it was just a little old star chasing around the sun with a pack of others, some of them a lot brighter than us. Chad says that some folks took that news real hard. Kind of let the wind out of their sails all of a sudden. That ain't in the scriptures, is it, Jeff? I don't reckon so, but it's in one of the books Shad had brought out from Philadelphia. His mother looked thoughtful. <clears throat> the God the Lord God created the earth and all upon it, Jeff. I don't like to hear that his work weren't for the be of the best. But don't you see, Ma? He created the sun and the moon and stars, too. Some a little bigger, others maybe a little prettier. Seems like people on Earth believe we had the best diggings just because we wanted to believe that. Because it made us feel important. You can't, you ain't watching to keep the tip tops facing up, Jeff. Ellen said quietly, pointing with the top, tip of her toe. He stooped and turned a cutting over. Guess I kind of got carried away with my own noise, he said, flushing. Her eyes went a little white. Well, you done me a favor. Telling me things I ain't never learned and giving me some something to ponder over. It amazes me, Jeff, what <clears throat> it does for a fact. The way you can recollect all the things Chad tells you and how you can put them away for his way of talking into mine. She hoed in silence for a minute and then paid him the great compliment of going back to his story. Did you tell me what the old feller's name was? The one that done all the figure? His name was Copernicus. I can even spell it for you if you're a mind. Chad made me learn how to say it and spell it too. Sounds like a furniture. A furniture. Je Jethro nodded. I allow, he agreed. And on side. Seems like furriners is always stirring up something. Well, the pot can't call the kettle black. Look, or we're stirring up amongst ourselves. She was back to the problems of the times, and Jethro knew that he could not tempt her away from them. For months he had moved along the edge of the fur, 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 fur that raised among the adults of his family, in the neighborhood, and even the church. He knew that there had been fights in the neighborhood, anger and triumph over the election of President Lincoln in the fall. But he supposed, if he thought of it all, that this was the nature, natural behavior 
of people interested in a vague thing called politics. He had heard of heard talk of tariffs of slave states and free ones, of a violent old man named John Brown, and a, during the past winter, of states seceding from the Union. But it had just been talked to him. The only part of all the talk that held any interest for him was the conviction among all the men that war was sure to break out sooner or later. It hadn't broken out yet. However, some men were, were swearing because President had not declared war, while others were just saying, Jess, Jess, let, <clears throat> just let a wave fire on the south and watch Kentucky, Missouri, Tennessee, yes, and maybe southern Illinois tumble over on the Confederate side of the fence. He knew a little about wars. The Revolution, of course, the American Revolution, Shadrach had pointed out, and Jethro had been amazed that there was ever any other. He liked stories of wars. There was a beautiful one to described in one of Shad's books in which an ancient king watched his ships fight in the, in a place called Salamis Bay. There was another exciting story of a battle in which small, fast ships, with the lucky help of a violent storm, had played old Ned with a proud and mighty, mighty navy. He wanted to tell his mother about that one, how if the battle had gone the other way, both Ellen and Jethro Creighton might well have been speaking Spanish as they planted their potatoes that April morning. She wouldn't have liked that, though. She was suspicious of people who spoke a different language. Well, one language when to speak and one to keep his long uh, tongue between his teeth. Jethro was not going to talk to his mother too much of either languages or wars, but he knew that as long as as far as the latter was were concerned, he was one with young Tom and Eb when they hoped that war would come soon. War meant loud brass music and shining horses ridden by men wearing uniforms finer than any suit in the stores at Newton. It meant men riding like kings, looking whatever to the right nor the left. Well, lesser men in perfect lines stroll along with guns across their shoulders and had their heads held high like horses with short reins. When the battle thundered and exploded on all sides, well, some men were killed, of course, but the stories of war that Jethro remembered were about the men who managed to live through the thunder and explosion. Matt, Creighton's grandfather, had lived through the Revolutionary. Matt himself had survived the Mexican War, and Uncle <coughs> Billy's Jeffers down the road was still alive to tell the tales of World of 1812. Jethro, forgetting his lecture to his mother on the inclination of people to be beliefs that pe bring them most satisfaction never doubted that if Tom and Ed got their panic chance to go to war they'd be back home when it was over and that would be shadowy from men from distant parts of the world who died in the pages of future history books. Death however was neither simple nor lightly brushed aside when it struck home Jethro frowned. He didn't like to think of his sister and Mary's death, but some memory had been touched off as his thoughts wandered. Let a few hours of work go by and let one's body begin to weary a little. Then thoughts that had been all of beauty and spring a while before started turning to things that were better forgotten. He had not forgotten, though. He had been only seven that winter of 59, but the memory of the tragedy would always be sharp and terrible in his mind. Mary had been as pretty as Jenny, only blonde and more delicate. Jethro remembered that it was a bitter night, and that he had stood with his nose pressed against the cold window pane, watching Rob Nelson help her into the wagon before they left for a dance over toward Hidalgo. What happened later, he pieced together from loud outcries and scraps of conversation deep in the middle of the night. It seemed that a crowd of young <coughs> toughs from the south of the county had broken uninvited into the dance, waving whiskey bottles and shouting drunken insults at the guests. As things began to look more and more dangerous, Rob found Mary's wraps and they were starting for home when a drunken youth named Travis Burdo saw them leave and followed them on horseback. Rob told Matt Creighton how he had urged the team hoping to get to Ed Turner's farm when he could get help because he knew that Burdo was armed. Rob had succeeded in getting as far as Turner's driveway when Burdo, seeing that his game was about finished, rode up beside Tom's team and fired a pistol over the heads of the horses. The frightened animals bolted through a rail fence, overturning the wagon and kicking themselves loose from the tongue. Mary was dead when Rob and Ed Turner pulled her from the wreckage. The 
The countryside was in an uproar the next day when news of the tragedy got around. Matthew Creighton was held in high esteem by his neighbors, and the senseless killing of his daughter stirred up a rage that was heightened by the fact that the whole Birdo family was commonly despised throughout the countryside as a shiftless lot with a bad background. The grandfather of Travis Birdo had come from somewhere farther downstate, and when he moved into Jasper County, he came hurriedly in order, so the story went, to escape a mob of citizens whose anger during years of petty thieving had exploded over the theft of a team of horses from a prosperous farmer. Whether the story was true or not, suspicion and dislike settled upon the family, and 30 years had failed to dissipate it. The Birdo children were nicknamed Jail Birdos by ta taunting schoolmates and persecuted in a hundred petty ways. Dave Birdo, father of young Travis and son of the alleged horse thief, horse thief was a sullen, silent man who shunned people in general and accepted their insults as a matter of course when he was forced to deal with them. His sons, for the most part, were much like him except when liquor thick quickened <clears throat> their courage and defiance. The shot that Travis Burrow fired over Rob Nelson's team that night was a shot fired at a society that had kicked a boy from childhood on because he bore his grandfather's name. And so the anger of the mob at Mary's death was doubled and tripled because a Birdo was responsible. By late afternoon, a crowd of 50 or more armed men stopped at the Creighton cabin to tell Matt of their intention of hunting Travis Birdo down and hanging him on the spot. But Matt Creighton had intervened, and it was a mark of the respect he commanded in the community that the men listened as he stood for an hour in the icy afternoon, pleading with them to keep their hands free of further bloodshed. Jethro, understanding the situation more fully now, that he was older, wondered at his father's intervention that afternoon. His own sympathies, even on a spring morning 18 months later, were with the angry men as they prepared for the manhunt. He wondered. He had a great confidence in his father, but his sense of justice was hard to prove, to accept the fact that Travis Birdo had been allowed to escape the consequences of his drunken crime. <clears throat> it occurred to him that he felt the same way toward his father as he did toward Abraham Lincoln. Why should the president waver so long? Why should he refuse week after week to start the great explosion which the young men wanted to get started and have finished before the year was well into the summer. Jethro had to admit to himself an uncomfortable feeling of anger for both the president and his father. They had not shown the hard, unyielding attitude that he admired in the talk of Tom and Eb and their friends. He sighed su suddenly and deeply at his perplexities. Ellen noticed the sigh and glanced at him quickly. Be you spent, Jethro? He shook his head. No, I'm doing tolerable. I was just thinking about things. What kind of things, son? For one thing, I was wondering why Abe Lincoln can't make up his mind about war. I wonder, is he like Pa? Is he so against having blood on people's hands that he preferred to start a war? Ellen stopped her work and stood for a moment without speaking, her rough brown hands resting on the hand handle of the hoe. He's like a man standing where two roads meet, Jeff, she said finally. And one road is dark and fearsome, and the other, there ain't a choice between the two. <clears throat> and yet, a choice has to be made. She shook her head. May the Lord help him, she whispered. May the Lord guide his hand. The sounds of mourning were all around them as they stood silently in the middle of the furrow. From the fields across the creek came the monotonous shout to the field. Horses up at the house, Jenny's voice came clearly, pleasant, as the sound of a little bell ringing. Here, chick, she called. Here, chick, 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 chick. Ellen slowly reached out with her hoe and blow a cod of dirt into crumbling fragments. Well, we got planting to do, Jeff, she said at last, and they went on with their work.